to friends, sister Jamia, my dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In the name of Allah, the sustainer of all the worlds, spheres, realms, and domains, I'm deeply humbled to be able to share some of my thoughts with you today on this most blessed day of Juma in this most blessed month of Ramadan. I've thought long and hard about honoring the invitation to come here and to speak because I've been filled with trepidation as to my experience and my knowledge in matters of our perfect way of life, Islam. But I'm beginning to realize that doubting oneself is more enabling than it is disenabling because it pushes one to be in a state of constant seeking because real faith it has no easy answers. It involves an ongoing struggle inside us and continuous questioning of what we know with an awareness of our own limitations, what we do not know and probably will never know. I must also note that I'm speaking here during Youth Month in South Africa and also as just Sister Jamia mentioned, International Children's Month. And I'm not generally a fan of these months and days, but sadly, uh, you know, the reason why is because they've become trivializing events and the true essence and meaning of justice has been watered down to a day or a month. There should be no day, no month, because these are matters that should always be on our collective agenda. As many of you know that I've regularly spoken about free decolonized education. However, today I want to spend a little time sharing my thoughts on an even younger segment of the youth in South Africa. Thus, I'll be speaking on the responsibilities of society towards children, and I'll draw lessons from observations uh, that I've made from traveling, and also looking at this from an Islamic perspective. In the past two years, I've had the privilege of traveling quite a lot, and the small encounters that I've had with children have left a painful mark on me. At a train station in Delhi, in India, I took out an apple to eat. As I bit into it, I was surrounded by a group of young children who were ready to fight for it between themselves. On the streets of Istanbul in Turkey, where there are many refugees, mostly from Syria, I was followed by young girls and boys begging for money, begging for food, and for anything that I could give them. And on the daily, in South Africa, from Johannesburg to Pretoria to Cape Town and beyond, I'm greeted by children and robots begging for change. Change and actual change. A change in their circumstances, but due to the desperation of their situations, like children everywhere else in the world today, they will take anything that you give. And this, to me, is one of the most abnormal normalcies in the world that we live in. The sight of children begging on the streets. The inequality that we see on every street corner and robot should make us angry. But many of us have become used to it, desensitized, apathetic, complacent. And it's hard to decide which word is more apt. Because we have abnormalized, we have normalized an abnormal situation. And it's getting worse. Through social media and TV, we see images every day of children in Yemen whose rib cages protrude and bellies swell from starvation. Children in South Sudan who have been forced into being child soldiers. Babies in Rohingya refugee camps born exactly nine months after soldiers of Myanmar's army had raped women. Children in the DRC who mine cobbled in horrendous conditions. The same cobalt that enters the supply chains of some of the world's biggest brands, from Apple to Samsung to Dell to Microsoft to Tesla, and I could cite more examples from all around the world. And it's hard to watch this, even more so because we feel helpless in the face of global tyranny and the kind of evil that you cannot pinpoint because it has become so deeply embedded in the lack of moral fiber of human beings. Paul Mason, a reporter, spoke about the hypocrisy he witnessed amongst global leaders after 
the, the Gaza attacks in August 2014, when Palestinians were systematically destroyed by drone strikes, shelling, and sniper fire. 1,500 civilians were killed, one third of their children. And yet in February 2015, less than a year later, he witnessed the US Congress give 25 standing ovations to the man who ordered the attacks. Sister Croatia Suleiman writes that if we look at the environment, there are 25 critically endangered species. And it's not the cockroaches and the rats. It is those animals with the qualities in us that are disappearing. It's the eagle with its brilliant vision and fearless protection of its young. It's the lion with its power to lead. It's the tiger with its grace and patience and the leopard with its agility to operate at warp speed, the elephant with its amazing empathy. These are the qualities of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and these are the qualities that are so scarce today. And we tend to think about our religion as a set of rituals, and the word of God, or the word God just doesn't quite capture what Allah is. Allah is a cosmological concept, Allah means a divine force that creates life in the universe, a creator of life with intelligence. Everything in the universe is created through this force. Be and it is. Two years ago, we lost the greatest of all time legendary boxer and one of the greatest human beings of our time, Muhammad Ali. He described Allah beautifully. He said, he has no eyes though he sees. He has no ears, though he hears. He remembers everything with no aid of mind and memory. He is supreme, the wise. And in Ramadan, we're encouraged to read the Quran and to reflect of the words of Allah. And my elder brother Hussein often speaks to me about his reflections and a few days ago spoke to me about what he thought while reading Surah Nahal, the bee. In it, Allah speaks of the warm, nutritious milk that comes from the belly of the cow, and the sweet and healing honey that comes from the belly of the bee. And so we pushed to think, what do our bellies as human beings create? We need to ponder on this, that we've allowed ourselves to become mere consumers, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with a much bigger purpose, which is to be his khalifa on earth. And to be the Khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to be his representative. To, through his mercy, create an environment and defend the principles of justice, kindness, mercy, abundance, love, and awareness. To exist in this world, and most importantly, to leave it in a better condition than we find it. Decades ago, the famous poet Iqbal proclaimed, Today, more than anything else, humanity needs spiritual interpretation of the universe. And today, if we look at the progress in the world, in every space, but the state of its children, these words are perhaps even more relevant to us. Parents and guardians and society at large have an important responsibility to ensure that every child is pro protected from falling into negative actions and developing bad characteristics. But who is society? A poet, Samantha Wilcox, once said that society is divided into two people. The one group are made of people who divide society into two people, and the other group is the rest of the world. And she wasn't talking about a split between good and bad, because she argued half are good and the other half are bad. But jokes aside, today we live in a pluralistic society, and pluralism is an unavoidable fact. We are equal citizens, but with different cultural and religious backgrounds. So how can we, instead of being obsessed with differences within communities, change the viewpoint to define and promote a common ethical framework, nurtured by the richness of diverse religious and cultural backgrounds? Children cannot be left to the wind, 
in all of this because even though the child is naturally born in a pure state, the environment can corrupt them. No one is born racist or sectarian or ruthlessly individualistic. These qualities are picked up from the surrounding environment. And we live in a country whose history is a nightmare that we're still trying to awake from. And in this nightmarish reality, the family unit has been completely destroyed. We have fatherless households, child-run homes, abusive guardians. And I know I said I wasn't going to speak about Fismas 4, but I think that this relates to the topic. The way society raises its children today will determine its success or failure tomorrow. And I remember during the Fismas 4 protests, a worker at Fitz once came to me and she had her little grandchild next to her who was about six or seven years old. And she pointed to her grandchild and said that this is why, this is why I support what you guys are doing. But at the same time, with a smile on her face, her tears filled with, her eyes filled with tears because we had just won a victory where the children of workers at WITS would be able to study for free. And her children never finished the trick. So that benefit would not have been of any relevance to them. Because in South Africa, 50% of students at school drop out between the age of, between the grades 10 and 12. And if graduates are finding it hard to find employment, imagine what happens to these young people. They are the forgotten generation. As a teenager, I remember writing an exam essay, um, and it was on injustice and the world and how by a stroke of luck I was not born in poverty, but instead I was born in a very privileged home where my needs as a child were all taken care of. So I was clothed, fed, educated, and most importantly, I was loved. But being loved is not just for the privileged. We have in this country hearts who leave their homes and children in order to earn money by taking care of another's family and another family's children. How often do we take for granted the impact of the absence of the domestic worker who is also a mother on the lives of their children? The divide that exists between childhoods in this country is profound. And through the eyes of children, one can from time to time see this tired hopelessness that everything good feels like a mirage. You can see it, but it remains out of your reach completely because you were born poor and you were born black. The hardest thing to witness when we know well that the eyes of a child are meant to reflect pure innocence of the world and carefree joy, and yet they've been replaced. These sacred things have been replaced by hopelessness. In Surah Ma'un, Allah says, Have you seen the one who denies the final judgment? That is the one who repulses the orphan and does not encourage feeding the poor. So woe to those hypocrites who pray, yet are unmindful of their prayers. Those who only show off and refuse to give even the simplest aid. Ibn Mas'ud reported that the Prophet ﷺ said, The son of Adam will not be dismissed from his Lord on the day of resurrection until he's questioned about five issues. His life and how he lived it, his youth and how he used it, his wealth and how he earned it and spent it, and how he acted on his knowledge. Zakat, like a lot else in Islam today, has become ritualized. We give, but we don't question what we can do to change the economic situation and the reality of the poor. We sometimes forget that Muhammad وسلم, was a radical advocate for social and economic justice, and that Islam is about deep sacralizing oppressive structures, from the pharaohs to the Roman Empire to the Dutch colonialism, British colonialism, apartheid, money, state structures that are oppressive and corrupt, and even our own nafs, because the central belief Tawheed 
is that Muslims only submit to Allah and nothing and no one else. In Sayyid Qutb's Social Justice in Islam, he quotes Ibn he quotes Imam Ibn Hazm, delivering a fatwa to the effect that if a person dies in starvation in any town, the people of that town will be responsible for having killed that person. This level of responsibility for the collective, and in particular for the poor and the vulnerable, is not present in our hearts today. Tawheed is to acknowledge Allah's oneness and turn our attention from all other distractions and instantaneous gratifications that our fast-paced world now has to offer. And this, brothers and sisters, is a revolutionary concept. Malcolm X said, I'm for truth no matter who tells it. I'm for justice no matter who is for or against it. I'm a human being first and foremost. And as such, I'm for whoever and whatever benefits from humanity as a whole. The Quran is addressed to both men and to women. Believing men and believing women. And furthermore, our responsibility as Muslims is not just to Muslims. It is to all of humanity. We must ask ourselves then, if a five-year-old Muslim child drowned in a pit toilet at a school in the way that five-year-old Michael Kamape drowned, would our reaction have been different as a society, as a community? If the Paul's Literary C School found that 78% of South African grade 4 learners in Muslim schools could not read for meaning in any language, rather than more generally in the, the country, particularly in poor black schools, would our reaction be different? If the 3.7 million orphans in this country were Muslims, would we do more for them? If the answer is yes, then we have a lot of work to do. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Ra'ad, verse 11, that He will not change the condition of a people until they change their own state, meaning that we have to take the first step, which is to make dua at first, to have positive intentions and thoughts, but they then need to be backed by action. And these actions do not always have to be big, they just need to be sincere, sustained, and coordinated, because together we can do more. How many times has, small for, has, a, has a small force vanquished a large army by the will, will of Allah? Because Allah is always with the steadfast. Let us reflect on David's victory over Goliath. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, and the small group of Muslims being victorious over a group almost 10 times their size at the Battle of Badr, and Hajar, peace be upon her's place in the Islamic tradition. Ali Shariati describes Hajar's burial near the third pillar of the Kaaba, and noted that all of the Hajj is joined to her memory. Allah chose a black slave woman, the most humiliated of his creation, to be the mother of great prophets and manifestations of the most magnificent values which God creates and places her beside himself. In South Africa, Muslims are less than 2% of the population, but we have a very, very big role to play. There was a time here in South Africa when practicing Islam was punishable by death. Today, we can practice freely and we know that our existence has a higher purpose. And in this is a huge responsibility because we've been given intellect and free will to create goodness in the world. And we must constantly ask ourselves, are we doing this? And where do we start? If we want to be a society that cares for its children and for the vulnerable, since that is what we are judged by, we are taught that there's a dichotomy of human nature we are both bestial and angelic, both selfless and niggardly. And one is, one is the one that wants to give inside of us, the other one is the one that wants to take and to hold on. And the very first state of a human being is submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's called the fitrah state, and this is the state that children are born in. The closer we get to the state, the closer we get to 
النفس أو متا متأمنة مطمئنة sorry the highest level of the نفس the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said the rich, that wretched is the slave of dinara and dirham slaves of stuff of the world self awareness is knowing what we are slaves to and freeing ourselves from being slaves to anything but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i'll end with a story about the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam during the early days in makkah when islam was being challenged and very horrible things were being said about him. He encountered a poor woman who happened to also be blind on the street. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said to her, Ya Ummi, my mother. And she said to him, Ya Ibni, my son. And they had a conversation with love and respect as complete strangers. But not long after the conversation started, did she say that there's this man who came and his name is Muhammad and he's ruining my city. He's spreading la ilaha illallah and he's saying that he is the Rasul of this Allah. And the Prophet is now in a very awkward position because she's hating on him right in front of him. And so he says, Ya Umi, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that you feel this way. What can I do to help you? And she's insistent that she wants to leave. She wants to leave Mecca, she wants to leave the city. And so he says, okay, how can I help you? And uh, realizes that the way that he can help her is to walk her to wherever she wants to move. And so he does. And uh, they gather her belongings and he walks her to the outskirts of town until she says, this is the spot that I want to settle in. This is the spot that I want to, um, to live in. And the entire journey, she says nasty things about him, and he just listens and takes it patiently. He sets up the things that she has at the spot. He builds a little humble home. He cleans it. He does her errands. And eventually, he says to her, Ya Umi, I'm done. Is there anything else that you need from me? And she says, No, thank you so much. You've been so kind to me. You can, you can leave. And so he turns his back and he begins to walk away and she calls him and she says that you've been so kind to me my son but I forgot to ask what's your name and he says to her I am the Muhammad that you hate so much and right there on that spot she said la ilaha illallah we must reflect on the story and if we encountered someone from the most marginalized would we do the same would we ask Allah to make us of those who react in these situations the way in which the Prophet did? And I want to end with the dua. We ask Allah to make us of those who embody the character of Rasulullah and who extend our ibadah not just to praying, fasting, and zakah, but also to see the way we function with and serve our fellow 55 million South Africans to be in itself an act of ibadah. Amin. Um, shukran. Assalamu alaikum. Shukran, Jadira, uh, sister. Jadira, thank you so much for taking out.